Welcome to Wealth Well Done. Together, we'll cover a wide range of important topics surrounding money and the impact it has on our lives. From the sophisticated and highly valuable planning techniques of the ultra wealthy to the commonly underutilized biblical teachings. Together, we'll work to improve our relationship with money and our effectiveness in stewarding it well. Here's your host, Eric Scoville. Welcome to the 77th episode of the Wealth Well Done podcast, where we are examining tactical, practical, and biblical ways to help you effectively steward your wealth well done. Uh, You probably already can tell here, I apologize that my voice is a little off, still trying to get over a a bit of a head cold here. Um, We're going to jump right in because last week we we were on on estate planning basics and uh, covered a lot, especially right at the end there. I had an example that we uh, rolled through pretty quickly, and I'm going to um, go deeper into the estate planning again today. We're going to get into some different types of trusts that you can use, as well as some other specifics that would be that be helpful to you. Um, it's important that you don't grab some something like this without getting the basics that we talked about last week. So I would encourage you to go back and listen to last week's if you didn't. Um, Starting with a disclaimer here, everything everything in this is meant to be for educational purposes for you. Um, this obviously doesn't pertain necessarily to your specific situation, so I would hope that you would take this, uh, anything that you pick up from here, and go talk with your estate planning attorney, go talk with your financial advisor, uh, and ask them ask them more about this. Or some of the stuff we're going to talk about is, is, is uh, very tax-heavy as well. So talk with your CPA and, and make sure that your financial team is, um, is giving you all the information that you need on this. If you, if you feel like you um, need, you're not getting enough uh, from them, then certainly you can reach out and, and ask some more questions here. We'd be happy to give you guys some guidance. All right. Uh, jumping in here. So what I want to first talk about is the difference between a, revo- a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust. A revocable trust is one that it's you have the power to change it. At you, you set this up, you have the power to change it for the rest of your life. As long as you have, you can you know, prove that you are in some type of uh, decent mental capacity, then you can continue to change this. Whereas an irrevocable trust, um, in order to get that change, could require either a court order to prove that it was. Uh, set up incorrectly or fraudulently, um, the person who set it up wasn't in their right mind, or needs the beneficiaries of that irrevocable trust to um, sign off on it. Sometimes there might be tax consequences to unwind something like that as well. So when you think about this thing, revocable means you have access to change it. It also means it's inside your estate still. Uh, Irrevocable you no longer have access to change that. And typically the reason that you would do that is because you want to move assets outside of your estate. And for that, we're talking about um, the estate tax limit is is the main uh, thing that we're focused on there. So the the main type of trust that you're going to use inside that's a revocable trust is a revocable living trust. Uh, those two words are often used uh, in conjunction with each other. And the living trust is is one that allows you to um, you, you will still have a power of attorney. You'll still have a uh, you'll have a pour over will. You'll still have um, some of these other components that you would think maybe apply more toward a will. But you'll have a lot more control um, over the assets and also over the guardians and trustee. And so inside a living trust here, I'm just going back to look at it. We, we talked a decent amount about this on the on the last week's episode. So I'm actually going to bypass most of that discussion and we'll, we'll jump to the next one. So just understand the living trust is one that you can, uh, it's still inside your state. You can change it at any time. And, um, and then that is one that, that gives you the most, um, the most control over your assets. Whereas these, these next few we're going to talk about, um, they, you, you start to cut off your control. Your control is, is finished at the time that you, um, that you make these changes. And so those type of trusts, these irrevocable trusts are going to be outside of your estate. And what that means is when we talk about the estate tax exemption, if you have these assets, um, once you, whatever gift you make to the trust is, is uh, valued. And then that value, if you have exceeded the annual exemption, which is $18,000 per year per person today, uh, it'll go up to 19000 next year. But if you exceed that annual exemption, then it counts against your lifetime exemption. 
and that lifetime exemption, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, is uh, currently 13.61 million per person uh, for the federal, so 27.22 million uh, for a, a married couple. And the um, there are also some states that have different exemptions uh, in there, like the state of Illinois that has a $4 million cap per person. So if you use, if you put, if you were to go put uh, a $10 million gift into one of these irrevocable trusts, then that's going to go against your lifetime exemption there. But um, that money has now been moved outside your estate. So whatever that money, if that $10 million grows to $300 million, it doesn't matter. There's no taxes. There's no more taxes owed on that to hand that down to the next generation um, from the estate tax portion. There could be assets on, on liquidation side of that, but that's another it's another topic. Okay, so uh, a few different types of irrevocable trusts. One is going to be the irrevocable life insurance trust. And so this is often referred to as an ILIT, I-L-I-T. And this is something that you do if you're going to put a, a life insurance policy in place um, on yourself, on you and your spouse, and you want to have the, uh, the next generation or a future generation be the beneficiary of that. And so you could, um, so what, what people often do here is they're going to use whole life or some other permanent product, whole life or universal life. One that's going to be guaranteed to pay out is typically what they're going to put into an islet. And they are going to have that. Um, or how that works then is, let's say we put a $20 million life insurance policy uh, on on myself. Well, I don't pay, that doesn't use $20 million of my lifetime exemption, of me and my, my wife's lifetime exemption. What that would actually use is the exemption is how much I pay in premium each year. Um, that's what goes against that. So if that premium is $250,000 a year, then I'm going to pay... Uh, every year when I make that gift into that islet, I'm going to make a gift into this the islet's bank account. So it'll have its own bank account, and then there's some rules around that of how you you need to actually give the beneficiaries notice that that money's in there. They need uh, 30 days to have a chance to withdraw that, and if they choose not to, then the islet uh, uh, trustee can choose to then use those that. Uh, that money to then pay the life insurance premium. And so each year, that's going to be $250,000 that comes against my lifetime exclusion. And so if I died tomorrow, well, then the $20 million got passed down outside my estate and only paid $250,000, only used $250,000 against my lifetime exemption to do it. Whereas if I lived on for another 50 years, then every time I make that $250,000 gift, I'm continuing to use more of my lifetime exemption. Next one is a SLAT, a Spousal Lifetime Access Trust, so S-L-A-T. These are a type of trust where, and we're, you're seeing this a lot in terms of people trying to get their uh, estate moved out or get their assets moved outside their estate before the federal exemption sunsets in, at the end of 2025. So uh, it's set to basically cut in about about in half. Um, we'll see what the calculations for inflation are, but it'll, it'll be somewhere around half of what it is at the end of 25 is where it was set to go to at the beginning of 2026. And so uh, what people do here is they're going to say, a uh, husband is going to make a gift to the wife and I'm going to, it's a spousal lifetime access trust. So I'm going to gift her $13.5 million and then in that she has access to that money for the rest of her life. But then um, anything beyond that, anything that's left in that account after she passes, then is set to go on to um, to the beneficiaries of that trust. And if that 13.61 million, again, grows to 100 million, it doesn't matter. That has already been moved outside outside my estate. And so that I used my estate tax limit there. And, and now she's, um, whatever happens to that money, she can use, she can use it and the trust will set some, some rules around that. And then anything else that's left can get handed down to the kids. What you cannot do is you can't, I can't make a 13.5 or $13.61 million gift to my wife. And then the same day, she also does one back to me, uh, and think that, that we have now moved that money outside of our estate. The, uh, the IRS does not see that as they see that as, as you're just trying to buy, make a, basically you're, you're, you're committing not tax fraud, but you are trying to do that for the sole purpose of, 
of the tax benefit and you're bypassing the the uh, main premise of the rule. And so they will actually unwind those and not count those as uh, outside of your estate because all you're doing is you're saying, hey, I'm giving you 13.5 million, you give me 13.5 million. And now we're now we still have access to all of our money, but we don't uh, have to pay it for estate taxes. And so, so from that standpoint, they're, they're looking at the fact that the gifts are not made very close together. So some time between those. So for someone who's trying to get this done before the 2026 uh, deadline, the end, end of 2025 deadline, then you really want to get started on that right away. So that way you can allow there to be uh, many months of time between when one gift was made and bet- and the next gift, they're also looking that they're not reciprocal, that they're not um, a tick for tack kind of thing, and you know, the the same dollar amount is is going into both. So some important things there, uh, but this is especially helpful uh, for in in states like Illinois. So in Illinois, when you have a four million dollar exemption per person that you can hand down before the Illinois estate tax kicks in, the um, it, federally, if you have, if if I if I passed away with, if 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 I pass away with my wife and I have twenty five million dollars, then my thirteen point six one million, if I didn't use all of that, whatever I haven't used so far, just get goes to my wife, and my wife basically has my exemption and her exemption to use at her passing. At Illinois, Illinois does not do it that way. Illinois says if I don't use my exemption at the point of my passing, it doesn't transfer over. So I have four million to to that I can move outside my estate upon my death, and anything above that that I move upon my death is taxed uh, at for Illinois, and then the and, and that's up to a sixteen percent level here, um, and each state's different. But if I don't use whatever I don't use of that. It doesn't transfer to my wife. So my wife still only has a $4 million exemption as well before anything else that she passes on gets taxed. So the spousal lifetime access trust is uh, is definitely helpful there, depending on uh, your goals. And we're going to talk about the goals here in a minute. The next one to think about is a generation skipping trust. And so a generation skipping trust is, is a way that a grantor, and so I'm going to use the, the analogy of, of generations here, G1 being the Let's say G1 is the the oldest person, the grandpa, great grandpa, and, and grandmother. Um, so, so G1 is the they're going to be the grantors. They're going to be ones with the assets that they're handing them down. G2 would be their children. G3 grandchildren. You get the you get the role there. And so, what happens here is if the grantor wants to hand down a large estate and wants to not have it pay estate taxes at at his level, at his children's level, at his grandchildren's level, he could he could set it up where that that he moves assets all the way down to the great grandchild if he wants. Anyone who's alive, he can he can hand it down to. It doesn't have to be family. The person does have to be more than thirty seven and a half years younger than the uh, grantor, and they cannot be a current or a former spouse. So, none of those weird gold digger stories you hear about uh, work here, and so. From this standpoint now, a grantor is going to, let's say, you know, we're talking about a larger state. So let's say we're going to talk about, you know, $250 million. The grantor can hand that down and do the estate tax plan that he's going to do at his level. And then if he hands that down to his grandchild, then his children, when the children pass away, they don't, that isn't taxed again. And obviously those assets are hopefully going to grow between the time that the grantor makes that gift and the time that his children pass away. So this can get really powerful here as you, as you start to think about how much that can, that can grow over time for a grandchild's life or a great grandchild's life. So we're just skipping that, that generational tax, um, where this, you know, for the G2, the child standpoint, they can, you can see how they might feel slighted that they didn't get access to that money. Um, what often is, is set up here is that the that second generation, the children, are given access to any of the income that the trust produces. And again, you know, at a if we have a, a trust like a two hundred fifty million dollar trust, well, it's going to produce produce significant income that then those the children have access to, and then the grandchildren or the great grandchildren will then, um, however, the trust allows them to access the funds. It will it will allow them to do that, and so. Um, th- there's another kind of nuance in here that that they put in place that allows a, a generation skipping transfer exemption, um, which means that you, no tax is owed 
on that uh, transfer until the tax that is owed exceeds five million dollars. So it actually allows you to go even higher than uh, than what you would normally think. Next one here, the last one that we're going to talk about today is called a Q-tip, and so Q-T-I-P, a qualified terminable interest property. And so what this is for is not not always, but most often this is used in the case of a um, husband and wife. You know, someone has one of them ha- who are they're, they're remarried. They have children from a previous marriage, and uh, one of them has been the source of where the income has come from. You know, whether it's just families have handed down wealth, or or you know, someone made it and then they they remarried. What they have done is they can set up a Q-tip, and a Q-tip allows them to give access upon the upon the one spouse passing. It allows the other spouse to have access to the funds, um, access to income that that fund produces until they pass, and then when they pass, the, the money goes to the beneficiaries that the uh, the grantor, the person who set up this Q-tip, um, has designated. So. If we you know, just use an example here, you got a, you have a, a gentleman who uh, made his wealth. His wife passed away. They had three children. He remarried later in life, and he wants to take care of his spouse. And so we're going to use this two hundred fifty million dollars example. So he sets he sets all the money up into the Q tip, so that way the his spouse can have access to the income that 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 two hundred fifty million dollars produces for the rest of her life. So she's going to be very well taken care of. But then she can't use that. She can't take that money and disinherit that guy's children or go blow it. She can't use that, uh, you know, and have that money go where she gets in. She gets remarried and then gets divorced and that money gets separated all out or goes to her children. Um, what this does is it allows the the intended beneficiaries to get the money kind of no matter what. So it's outside the spouse's control. She can't she can't go in there and take more away than what the trust uh, allows her to have. All of the assets, the principal is going to remain protected to go to the beneficiaries. Um, and so it just allows them to kind of maintain control of those assets there. All of those types of trust, while powerful, and you can see the, the where you could come up with the specific types of examples where that would be um, used, they all need to fall under the, the premise of what what is the real plan that we're going after here. And so, um, if you if you if you if you're considering any of these, and I'm going to go over a few more kind of nuanced details here. But if you're considering these, you can understand like it's really important that you talk to an estate planning attorney who understands this, um, and also is I'm going to say fluent in it because someone who has who has heard about a Q-tip uh, but hasn't done them shouldn't be the one who are giving you that that deep guidance around, I think a Q-tip is better for you than a slat or than an eyelet and these other things. Like we want to make sure that the attorneys that you're using have experience in the type of work that you're, that you're talking about. Um, a couple other things that are important to understand is community property versus joint tenancy. Uh, this applies. There are a number of states that are community property states. So Wisconsin, Arizona, California, Idaho, Louisiana, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, Washington, and Alaska can opt into this. And what this what what uh, applies here is community. If you're a community property state, you can put the entire property, or you can set it up so the entire property receives a step up in basis upon the passing of the first spouse. So, spouse one, the you and uh, you and your spouse own um, own some significant assets. Let's say you own a piece of real estate that has grown in value from three million dollars to twelve million dollars. If you, if the husband passes away, and the wife wants access to that property to sell it to for whether she doesn't want to manage it or she also wants to uh, use the assets from it, well, if she sells that property now, they're going to owe uh, she's going to owe capital gains tax on nine million dollars, the three million to twelve million dollar growth that it's had. And so, what we what they can do here is they can set it up in a way that allows upon the passing of the first spouse then that $3 million property has taken a step up in basis to now be uh, a $12 million basis. So if she sells that property now at $12 million, there's no taxes owed, which is the same way that it works, um, the step up in basis if you're having, um, if you have stock. And so if you were, uh, we just had, just had a, a dear friend come in who lost her 
who lost her, her father and she, they had, um, they had stock that was, that had seen an incredible appreciation over this man's, this man's life. Had he sold that stock a day before he died, he would have owed taxes on all of that. But because he didn't sell it, then his, you know, his child now has access to all that stock she could sell at, you know, on that day when she inherits it, she could sell it all and have no taxes owed because the new basis has has moved up to what it was on the fair market value on the day of, of passing. And so that's how this uh, step up basis works here in this community property type issue. Uh, but need to need to make sure that again you're seeking counsel on that because um, this could affect different credit scenarios, um, tax planning. You want to make sure this this really fits well into your plan. Another nuance to be aware of as we talk about estate planning is per stirpes or per capita. And some these are Latin words here that you you wouldn't necessarily know what those mean. Uh, per capita means by the head, per stirpes means by the root. And so what you're thinking about here is um, a, a simple per capita example. This means it's, it's only for your surviving children. And so uh, this often comes in play when you're talking about, let's say, a life insurance policy, and you're set up the beneficiaries of it, and you have you have three children, and you want um, you want the the money to go to to your your children here. But if you set it up as per capita, then it, what that means is it goes to only the surviving children. So if if you had three children, one of them passed away and had you know two children of their own, so you had two grandchildren there, well the assets don't go to that family. It only goes to the two surviving children. Whereas uh, per stirpes allows it to go by the lineage. So therefore, if you have three children and one of them passes away, excuse me, then the that person's share, if you set it up a third, a third, a third, that one person's third that passed away will get handed down to their two children or however their estate is set up. And so then they would, so then they would, um, be able to get the you know they would split those two grandchildren would split one third of the life insurance proceeds so important to understand the difference between per capita and per stirpes when you're setting this up again you want to that, that's something that you don't ever hear people really talk about when they're setting these policies up they just assume that they have this uh, all straight obviously the the number one recommendation is to have your trust be the beneficiary that way that way, everything flows in through the trust exactly like you've got it set up. All right. Um, when we come to the 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 step up and basis side of this, just want to want to give some more uh, color around that. This is something that's under under quite a bit of attack politically, as you can as you can get imagine. It's very valuable if someone for, for some of these assets here, you can have someone who has had if they own stock in their their company and a lot of these you know families who have extreme wealth have owned stock in their in their company for their family company for a long time and when it was worth nothing and now it's worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars and if they hold that stock until they pass away and then hand that down to their children it gets the step up in basis and there's no taxes owed so obviously the government wants to get that uh, in that example or just someone's you know here in Peoria, lots and lots of people have held Caterpillar stock, and they've held it for a long time, or RLI stock, and and these stocks have seen massive appreciation. And so, if they hold those until they die, then the the beneficiaries of that are going to get all of those assets uh, without having to pay any taxes. Outside the exemption, I'm just talking about the capital gains type taxes here. And so, uh, as so long as they're under the estate tax exemption, um, then you know someone who would otherwise owe, let's just use an example, someone who would, would owe a couple million dollars in capital gains taxes doesn't have to pay that if if the they received a step up in basis. So this is uh, one of the things that's been on the chopping block from the Democratic Party, and uh, there's there's good there's good valid reasons for. For that, I, I honestly believe there are. There's also plenty of good reasons um, to keep it, and some of some of the tax rules that are being um, proposed right now are absurd and don't make any sense. And 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 from a you know a way of American farmers who have handed down land through generations, it's it would be very destructive. Some of the things that are that are being proposed, we're hoping that those don't get passed. But there's certainly plenty of room to 
to decrease some of the uh, tax breaks that the ultra wealthy get. And so it's just important for you to understand what's going on with those um, inside the these irrevocable trusts that we talked about. There is not a step up in basis. So those assets pass through the trust tax free or through the estate tax tax free. But when a child goes to sell those, the basis remains from um, from what the the grantor's basis. And so, uh, you know, in that example of someone who's handing down stock from a family company or or the you know caterpillar stock, you know, the, either one of those examples, if they've moved those into an irrevocable trust, any of those um, you know slat Q tip type trusts that we talked about, if they've moved it into those, then the the New ben- the beneficiaries of that when they receive that their basis is still the same basis as the grantors and so that that's important that, that stays calculated um, but it's also important because the taxes are going to be owed so you can move it outside the estate but then you don't get the step up in basis and so that's something that's uh, really critical into your planning as you as you look at how to handle all of this and obviously our goal is to be a steward and so Jesus talks about being being innocent as a dove and and shrewd as a serpent we want to be shrewd we want to make sure that we are making the right tax moves to to the best um to 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 maintain the best control over over our funds um but it's not just for the sake of how much money can we pass down to the next generation what we really want to be thinking about is what is best for for the next generation or the next few generations of your family, especially if you're talking about handing down any type of sizable estate. Um, there is significant weight on the, uh, on the, what impact that that gift will have to, to generations. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and say, you know, three generations out from you by your great grandchildren. Most people who have built the wealth, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, analogies that people use with this, but the, simplified version of it is people who build the wealth have often um, not done as great of a job of, of raising their children, not to blame anyone, but that's, that's often the case that they put so much focus on, on the business and on the skills that God's given them there that often the children have suffered, not always, but often, but those children who have grown up with maybe less involvement with their parents have um, also seen the work ethic. And so there might be some resentment toward the money. There might be some resentment toward the parents, possibly, not, ne- not necessarily, but there's definitely a, um, there is a, a, they understand the work that it took to, at least for the most part, they're going to understand the work that it took to, um, to build that wealth. The grandchildren won't understand the work, but they will get to hear it from their parents. And the parents um, will, you know, certainly communicate some about how much the grand, the grand, how hard the grandparents worked to build that the great grandchildren will have no connection to the work there um you know they use the example of um how many of you can can uh even tell you say what your great grandmother's maiden name was and most people have no idea they might know their grandmother's maiden name but most people have no idea what their great grandmother's maiden name is and so from from that standpoint that's where we're um talking about the the impact of handing down wealth to people who have not had any type of understanding of what it took to build this and have therefore have less respect for it. Um, it creates a lot of, of self-worth issues and identity issues. Now they can be overcome great parenting and great biblical guidance is, is going to be key there. But the you know, Bible talks about um, how foolish it is to hand down wealth without handing down wisdom. So really want to encourage everyone to consider whether you're handing down $100,000 or $100 million to think about what is the what is the impact of this on the next generation or future generations beyond that and how do I how do I prepare them today for the work um, or f- for the responsibility of of what I'm handing down to them we don't want to encourage children who are um you know, less than 30 years old to realize that they don't have to work very hard anymore because they have enough assets that they, they don't have to go be enterprising. They don't have to try hard in school. They don't have to uh, try hard in jobs. They don't have to, they don't have to str- uh, stretch themselves. And if, if someone doesn't do that, well, that, that is uh, be a very dangerous place for people. Not everyone, but most. 
And so really encourage you to, to reflect on that before you uh, decide what kind of gift you're going to give. I haven't yet to come across an example where it seemed like it was really in the child's best interest that they received $50 million or more than that. Um, doesn't mean that there aren't examples of this. And, and the family business is different if you're handing down the family biz, business and therefore there's significant wealth in that stock. That's that's different. Um, but still, there are really great examples of, of families who've done that well and, and put great controls on that. The, the Green family from Hobby Lobby. Uh, locally here, we have a number of, of families who have um, created large family enterprises that they have put good restrictions around access to the the, the stock of the company as well as um, the funds of the family. So I would encourage you, if you're in one of those positions, to to seek guidance from other families who've done this. There are a number of family office clubs and, and other uh, family office gatherings where you can you can talk to other people who have either the same wealth as you or more and get their get their stories so that way you can um, hear what's what's worked well. Um, I would just encourage you with any of that to make sure that you're putting that under a biblical guide because I've listened to many of those families talk about how how they've successfully handed down this much outside of taxes, but the children are rotten and and if the parents are only thinking about taxes and very worldly things, um, they have pride in how how well how crafty their estate plan's been, but They've done a, a terrible job at at preparing the next generations for for that kind of wealth. So obviously, make sure that the counselor the counsel you're receiving, whether this is the the financial advisor, the lawyer, um, very few people like that are going to be thinking from a biblical worldview that say, you know, is it really the right thing to hand down this much to your children? Um, is it and and would you, you know, should you consider what God wants you to do with that? That's that's not the type of advice. I have ever heard from an attorney when I have brought a client into them. Um, they're normally more shocked at the type of money that our clients are talking about giving away. And so I just encourage you to not not only uh, take the counsel of your of your uh, professional team, but also also heed the Bible's counsel around this as well. Talk to your pastor, talk to someone else. Um, again, we're happy to have conversations with you, even if we're doing nothing else besides give you a little advice around around a, a biblical perspective of how to how to handle um, an estate gift. All right, we're, we're going to call that good on the estate planning side. The uh, one thing I wanted to, to just point back to is if you if you did listen to episode seventy five, where I um, try to scare the crap out of you to make you question whether or not you're actually saved, <laughs> it's not really what I was trying to do, but but definitely do want to to jar us loose from our just uh, being lulled to sleep and, and thinking that we have everything, um, that everything's good. The uh, I'm, I just want you to know I'm, I'm doing a lot of searching on that. I'm doing a lot of searching around that topic, seeking advice from from plenty of, of pastors and other um, biblical scholars to try to to grab more of, of the depth of what, what Jesus is really talking about there. And so far, I will tell you, I have not been satisfied with the answers I'm receiving that it seems like people are just ignoring or, or kind of beating around the bush uh, with that passage and with, with Jesus' words and, um, and really forgetting the, the clear context in which he is he's talking about that. So, so we're going to revisit that. I'm going to keep doing some more research and I will come back to you um, on that some more. Um, if you're kind of wondering, well, what's that have to do with state planning? It's going to pull up Matthew seven and just kind of draw draw back to that again. When when Jesus says to me, or when Jesus says that um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name, which are the things that He's talking about in um, in in Mark sixteen, or the yeah, so similar things there, um, and then I I Jesus will then and then will I declare to them, I never I never knew you depart from me you workers of lawlessness. And so some people grab that and say, well, this is only for the workers of lawlessness. Um, I just think there's there's more to this that we need to be really aware of um, as as we're considering the estate planning as we're considering what we're trying to focus on in our lives. If you're not 
if if hearing those those comments in, in Mark 16, you know, when Jesus said that these these signs will accompany those who believe. If you're not believed, you if you don't believe, you'll be condemned. But these signs will accompany those who believe. Um, if if you're not starting to wrestle with that, then I just want to I want to challenge you that you don't just take some uh, premise that you've you've been told taught for a long time. You know, whether you're Calvinist or any anywhere anywhere in the spectrum here, that you that you let the Holy Spirit and the Word of God guide your thoughts more than more than a teaching that's been passed down for generations. And so, you know, because if you're not, if you can't prioritize that, if you can't prioritize Jesus's strong warnings on, hey, this is what it looks like to to believe and to be saved. Um, if that can't get enough of your attention, then I just want to question what the heck are you doing? <laughs> how, how, uh, how, how clouded can, can a judgment be that you wouldn't draw, give them more, more time and attention. So obviously I'm not your God. <laughs> nah, and so I'm not trying to be the God of, of anyone's life, but I do want people to, to take the word of God so much more serious than we are as a whole. And, um, really reflect on this and not let, anything that just I say or that just your pastor says or anything else, like none, none of us are the word of God. And so you need to sit with this. You need to spend time with God and form your own relationship with him where, where he can talk to you. And there are many people who will share other, other scriptures that, that give them peace and assurance about their salvation. And we're going to, we're going to spend time talking about that um, in, a, in another, in another episode here, but either way with us, I just want to make sure that everyone is, is taking it seriously enough to start to dig in for themselves, form that own their own relationship with Jesus. When he says, get away from me, I never knew you. You don't want to be one of the people who has, who's lived a life of great works and, or lived a wife, a life based on some really comforting promises in the Bible, but you don't have any relationship with them. So I absolutely want to challenge you to get in there and start forming a relationship with God. If you're struggling with how to do that, um, a book I've referenced before, Bob Sorge's Secrets of the Secret Place, is one of the best ways that if you start making time with God on a regular basis and you read that, just a, a chapter of that a day, it will help you draw closer to him as well. I highly recommend that. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. Thank you again for listening to Wealth Well Done. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player. And together, we'll continue to improve our relationship with money, and our effectiveness in stewarding it well.